I'm excited to welcome you to the Disorient Asian American Film Festival of Oregon. Uh, my name is Gordon Nagayama Hall, and I'm on the Disorient Board of Directors. I'm pleased to introduce you to a group of community elders who have made short films about AAPI history and experiences in visual communications digital histories program. We applaud and celebrate their creativity, humor, and lived experiences and their commitment to telling their stories. Uh, we have with us uh, from Visual Communications, uh, Abraham Ferrer, and he'll speak with us later, but I'll tell you uh, what each of the films are and who the directors are. Uh, Robert Shoji directed Fran. Teresa Matsushima directed Do You Love Me? Don Benai directed Kairu. Uh, Steve Nagano directed Putting Them Where They Could Do No Harm. Jeffrey Chop directed two films. Uh, Lori Lewis Manzanar, which is a music video. And then Jeffrey also directed Eating Tamales with Chopsticks. Uh, Fran Ito directed Year of the Plague. George Wada directed I'm Still Here. Patty Fong directed Paper Sun, uh, and Joe Veranta directed two films, The Conversation and Eye of the Needle. So I'd like to start with uh, Abraham uh, from Visual Communications. And Abraham, please tell us uh, a bit about how uh, Visual Communications Digital Histories program, uh, how that developed and how these filmmakers got involved. So Abraham. Oh, sure. Thanks a lot, Gordon. I'm happy to be here. Uh, basically, uh, the Digital Histories program really didn't start out as a visual communications program. It was essentially a core initiative of Little Tokyo Service Center here in Los Angeles when they established the Discovery Center as a means of, of um, allowing more mature Asian American folks to uh, harness you know, the power of technology in order to tell stories and and um, offer their perspectives in, a, uh, in an environment where um, you know, with accessib accessibility to technology, that the perception that um, older Asian American folks um, did not have anything to contribute um, in the way of you know, creative expression using technology. So um, um, you know, the very first edition of Digital Histories um, as, a, as a group of films, uh, debuted in 2005 and you know the group that you have here represents the um, 18th iteration of um you know of the program um when the discovery center went defunct uh, visual communications basically inherited the program in 2011 and we've been administering it ever since but you know definitely um you know we had to give props to ltsc you know for making that space and, and realizing, you know, that our, our more, more mature Asian American folks, um, you know, have, you know, have perspectives that, you know, that 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 need to be shared, and um, you know, we're happy to, you know, to make a space for them. Thanks, Abraham. Uh, now I'd like to uh, turn to the filmmakers. So, each filmmaker presents AAPI history through the lens of the life of an individual. And I want to ask each filmmaker why they chose the particular individual to feature in their film. So we'll start with Robert Shoji, who directed Fran. Robert. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, um, so again, yeah, the name of my film is Fran. And Fran is about Fran Ito, who, <clears throat> who is actually a Zoom call. And she made a film herself as part of this uh, series. So I interviewed Fran during one of the early peaks of the pandemic with a series of questions um, kind of designed to reveal her outlook on life. And so if you just saw the film or hopefully if you haven't seen them, you'll see it in the future, <clears throat> you could see that her answers kind of demonstrate her op optimistic outlook on life uh, despite the pandemic and a lot of other things going on in her life at the time. That's it. Thanks, Robert. Uh, now uh, we'll turn to Teresa Matsushima, who directed the film, Do You Love Me? Teresa. Hi. I, um, 
before starting this class, I was doing some downsizing and I came across this box of letters that I had exchanged with my dad. There were 80 letters. And then right after that, Don Benai in this class invited me to the video class. And so when we started to um, decide what kind of idea we were going to do for the film, I thought about making a film about the search for my dad. We had like a 30 year um, absence. And uh, so during that time, I uh, was having a lot of uh, issues with unforgiveness for him anyway. So I decided to try to do a film on that. And during that time, I had two dreams. The first dream was to start the movie with Dear Dad. And then the second dream was to end it with, with all my love, your daddy. And um, so it was kind of a process of uh, healing and uh, introspection. And um, anyway, it was, it was a very emotional thing for me to, to make this movie. And so that's the reason why I chose that topic. And um, that's, that's, oh, and, and because when my parents were divorced, I, my mother literally and figuratively cut out my dad and she cut all the photographs. Um, she cut him off the photographs. And so I only had two intact photographs of my whole family, which made it a little difficult when I was making the movie because I only had those two photographs. So I had to really scrounge for a lot of um, photos for the movie. Anyway, so that's, that's my story. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, now we turn to uh, Don Benai, who directed Kairu. Don. Um, good afternoon. So I think my first thing is a sense of gratitude, uh, both to your organization and uh, Digital Histories um, here in LA, and then uh, also the people that I have the opportunity to be in class with uh, because I, obviously the pandemic is key. This is my second movie. Um, so really the entire experience has been um, an opportunity and very much a lifeline. So when Abe talks about um, marginalized senior citizens, mature, people, um, then uh, the last two years has absolutely shown uh, to me that this has been a great lifeline. So with that being said, uh, I was really fortunate to uh, stumble across a Long Beach based artist by the name of Trace Fukuhara. So for those of you who uh, probably are unfamiliar with his work, he's been a um, a full-time artist for his adult life. And uh, and he has uh, more than a dozen pieces in the LA Harbor area, Long Beach and San Pedro, as well as he's got this, had this incredible, incredible garden that was in Long Beach on the property that was his family's nursery for over 50 years. So, um, on my side, it was just pure luck to uh, find the story among the incredible stories of Sansei, who uh, have been contributing to the community for so long. Thanks, Don. Uh, by the way, everyone should keep their cameras on uh, once they're speaking. Uh, so the next director is Steve Nagano and his film is putting them where they could do no harm. Uh, Steve. Steve, I think you're muted. Yeah, my, my film begins with the article, LA Times article that Rob showed you gave me, I don't know, maybe two and a half years ago, three years ago, that said, um, and it's in the film, uh, Bowron wants no Japs back to LA basically. And so who is this guy? And then with the renaming and the Black Lives Matters issue that happened during the pandemic, uh, I felt that, uh, back up a little bit, there's a, a plaza 
a square called Fletcher Bowen Square, which is like catty corner to Little Tokyo. And he was the mayor of Los Angeles from 1938 to 1953, the longest serving mayor of Los Angeles. And uh, he would have a weekly television uh, radio show in which in the film I have the, I, I got the transcripts and I had somebody read those. And so I recreated his radio shows and the things that he said about the Japanese, especially in 42, is just uh, unbelievable. I mean, for some of the things that are reasons why people change the uh, names of different buildings and things like that, I would say in, in some cases is relatively mild compared to what Fletcher Brown said. And of course, the consequences of it. At that time, there were close to 40,000 Japanese living in the city of Los Angeles, and about 90% of all Japanese in America were living on in California. So the things he would say was just absurd about like your 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 little Japanese neighbor is waiting for the the signal from the homeland. And so he he in that vein he just kept talking. You know, on on uh, Lincoln's birthday, February 12th, he said, "Oh, our mild manner." Uh, saint-like president would in no doubt lock them up. This is February 12th, 1942. And uh, he goes on to say, and, and I received a bunch of his memos that were uh, sent to, in this one case, to a senator. And he was advocating for the removal of citizenship of the, the Nisei that were born in the United States. And it's, he was so bad in the sense of he didn't even want Manzanar to be a relocation camp or concentration camp. He wanted it to be an assembly center because he felt it was too close to the water supply. And, you know, the Japanese would poison the water supply for L.A. So my film is actually an attempt to um, hopefully get the Japanese community, but not just the Japanese community, to support particularly African-Americans in their attempt to change and rename places. And in the same vein, uh, trying to get us in Los Angeles to put pressure on the city to change the name of Fletcher Bowen Square to something else. Thanks, Steve. Uh, next, we have uh, Jeffrey Chop, who directed two films. Uh, one is a music video, uh, Lori Lewis Manzanar, and then his second film that he directed is Eating Tamales with Chopsticks. Uh, Jeff. I've been fortunate enough to uh, be able to go to the Manzanar pilgrimage for several years. And uh, what I guess makes my experience unique is that um, there was a, a group of campers that uh, basically camped at the time of the pilgrimage to pay their um, respects to the experience that happened there. So as I was uh, looking for stories, uh, I, I wanted to see what Manzanar meant to people from uh, basically uh, different uh, experiences who were not necessarily Japanese. And uh, so when I did Eating Tamales with Chopsticks, uh, it's a story about uh, Ruben Guevara, who uh, is one of the most amazing artists that I ever met. And uh, just to make a long story short, um, a long time ago, there was an album out called Ruben and the Jets, which was uh, produced by Frank Zappa and uh, several of the Mothers of Invention. And it's a, kind of a, a classic uh, doo-wop album that has always been on my listening uh, list for a very long time and as fortune would have it. I was walking down the street one day in little Tokyo and there was Ruben Guevara. 
and I it, it it's amazing to meet basically a mythical character from you know from from what anyway so I met him and um I was tr basically trying to what I was trying to do was you know to find different voices about Manzanar so Ruben was among the campers and he actually began writing his autobiography uh, at the campsite. So it was, you know, just kind of like this merging of myth and reality that uh, really, uh, really made me feel good. And uh, Lori uh, and, and uh, the song Manzanar, uh, was again, it was a song written by Tom Rush, a uh, very well known songwriter and you know, folk singer. And uh, I was just totally amazed by the sensitivity and the nuances that you know, somebody from totally beyond the experience of Japanese Americans and of the camps was able to like. I think capture the the feeling of of you know what a hundred thousand people went through. So that's pretty much the basis of both my stories. Thanks, Jeff. I think uh, both of your films demonstrated how people uh, beyond the Japanese American community uh, could uh, understand or try to grasp uh, uh, the experience. Okay, thanks. So the next uh, director is Fran Ito, who directed You're the Plague, and the subject of the film is uh, uh, Mrs. Ito herself. So Fran, uh, please uh, tell us about your film. Uh, you're muted. You need to unmute. I, I'm Fran Ito, and this is my 11th film with digital history. And uh, the year of the plague, uh, I, well, I came about doing this was because I was actually locked down and I couldn't go out and film. So all of what I had on, the, on my storyboard or on, on my iPhone is where I got my film. I just pulled it from there, put it on my, uh, timeline and edit it and put some music on and that was it. But ha throughout that whole uh, pandemic lockdown, I was hospitalized three times. I went to the dentist. My, my house had water damage. I had to evacuate. I'm still not living there. Uh, and um, see what else? Uh, you know, I had electrical problems uh, and all of that. And I thought, just throw it all in and make a film. And then um, uh, I gave it the year of the plague, uh, and and uh, and I accidentally had this uh, the film that they use with the mass and everything. I thought, wow, that's perfect for the for the uh, cover, and uh, and I showed where I was vaccinated and all that. So I didn't have to go out to research; it was all in my iPad, iPhone. <laughs> That's it. Great, thank, th th thanks, friend. Yes. So the next film is uh, "I'm Still Here," uh, directed by George Wada. George, um, my film was driven by current events at the time. Um, the United States had pulled out of Afghanistan, and the photos in the newspapers were strikingly similar to what I remember back in the 70s when we left Vietnam. So that kind of kicked into my brain. Um, I, in my industry, in the aerospace industry, I work with a lot of Vietnamese, and each one has their own story of how they escaped Vietnam. And this particular coworker, it was kind of eerily similar to what I was seeing in the newspaper. So I was able to interview him and he was able to kind of explain 
what happened to him personally to escape Vietnam. And, and the interesting part, too, was that his kids were not necessarily aware of everything he went through. Um, they're living a typical American life. And so, too, does, too. And to this day, he's a middle-class American. But his history of what he went through and the experiences of his family was um, very similar to, I think, what is going on with Afghanistan's coming to uh, America. So that's what the film is about. Thank you, George. Uh, Patty Fong directed uh, Paper's Son. Uh, so Patty, tell us about uh, your film. Hi, uh, my name is Patty and my film Paper's Son is about my father, Benny Fong, um, in the late 1930s and in uh, early 1940s is when this movie starts um, the, my grandparents were able to secure false papers um, in China in order for my father to gain passage to the United States. Not uncommon for um, a lot of people trying to flee China at the time. This movie sheds light on my father's experience um, through Terminal Island Immigration Station down here in LA. Uh, a lot of people don't know that right out here in LA Harbor from 1938 to 1942, what is now a federal prison was used right after it opened in 38 to process immigrants and house immigrants while they were being interrogated. Um, my father was one of those many people that went through um, LA. And I, um, I think this movie was important for me to research and put together because I think it's important to know where you come from uh, to, have a, to gain a better understanding of who you are. And a lot of people my age and, and more so younger, the next generation, my children's generation, don't know about this story about Paper Sons because it's generally not taught in schools. So this through digital uh, histories is I, I was able to make this film to amplify this story. And it's my pleasure and my honor to share it with all of you. Thank you, Patty. Uh, so uh, Joe Verratta also directed two films. One is The Conversation and the other is Eye of the Needle. So Joe, please tell us about your films. Sure, thank you, Gordon, for uh, having us uh, join the panel today. It's, uh, it's been a whirlwind. Um, I'm a first time filmmaker. This is my first time out to uh, try to uh, express uh, my perspectives and my stories through uh, this particular media. So been learning a lot, been having a lot of fun. Uh, working with a great group of folks. Um, Eye of the Needle is really sort of a self-portrait. It uh, kind of is a reflection of the uh, uh, experiences that I had in coming to terms with the process of aging. Um, I, I think that as we get older, uh, we, we go through changes, uh, both physical, emotional, spiritual, and this was a, a way of for me to express not only the impact that uh, some of the aging process was having on me, but also my response to it. Um, how I decided <clears throat> to sort of resolve some of the, the issues that uh, getting older was putting in front of me. So I hope folks are able to uh, uh, enjoy the, uh, the film when they get to see it. The second one, The Conversation, is actually my favorite. It is a collection of eight millimeter film that my father shot during the 60s and 70s, combined with an interview my son did with my father in the uh, uh, in one of his ethnic studies classes about uh, five or six years ago. And so we have this conversation going on that I'm able to uh, blend with the old footage um tells the story of uh my family uh, getting established in uh, the neighborhood we grew up in 
in San Diego and the sort of the the immigrant narrative of trying to figure out are we Filipino, are we American, are we somewhere in between? Um, and uh, I think it's a, it's a reflection of a, an experience that many immigrant families can relate to. Um, but this particular one is told through the eyes of my father and the voices of my my son. So uh, it's uh, it was a great great deal of fun to uh, put that piece together. Thanks, Joe. So uh, we have just about eight minutes left, and I'd like to ask uh, as many of you as possible uh, what your current projects are. So if you can be brief, uh, that will allow everybody to get uh, a turn. So Abraham, uh, what are your uh, current projects? Uh, you need to unmute. That. Well, um, I, I think that I would um, rather defer because I'm, I'm, I'm actually um, I'm functioning as a mentor to these folks and helping them to get to the finish line. They're really the superstars of this program and, and what have you. And I think that uh, you should start off by asking them that question. Okay, thanks. Uh, Robert, current projects. Yeah, so <clears throat> not, sure, oh, not sure if it's going to be the final project, but um, I'm working on studying, his name is Kiyoshi Kuromiya, and he was a civil rights and anti-war activist in the 60s and 70s. Not very well known, so I'm hoping to get his story out there so people can learn more about his story. Um, among a lot of things that he did in his lifetime, one particular period I'm interested in happened in 1965 when he was in Alabama, and he was actually marching for African-American black voter, voter rights. Uh, he participated in a few marches, crossed paths with Martin Luther King. So I'm trying to sort that story out and hopefully, you know, get it into a film short enough that it'll be appropriate for the digital histories program. So yeah, um, you know, part of working on these films is doing the research and uncovering aspects of people's lives, kind of kind of like bringing them back to life and letting other people learn about their history and their story. So um, thanks. That, yeah. That's great. Uh, Teresa, current projects. Um, the uh, the second movie that I'm going to that I'm working on is on my mother. The first one I did on my dad, and the second one on my mother. And it's kind of following her journey of memory loss and going from a very normal person into starting to for being forgetful and writing on light bulbs and doing, you know, interesting things and just kind of showing her the progression as she goes down that path of um, forgetfulness. So that's my second film. Thanks. Uh, Don, current projects? Um, still up in the air because I can't, I don't know if I can get enough information in a timely fashion, but Gordon, you guys are fortunate, I think, up in uh, Oregon to uh, claim the residence of Garrett Hongo, as well as uh, Lhasa Minara, and uh, along with Alan Chung Liao from Seattle and a host of musicians from down here, we did a one-off event in 1977 at Cal State Long Beach, uh, combining uh, uh, poetry and jazz music. Uh, so I'm looking at it, and there's a big story there. Uh, the challenge is to piece at least some of it together. Great, thanks, Don. Uh, Steve, current projects? Uh, I'm leaning to a film on the Anzen hardware store. Um, it's the old store. It's 70 some years old. Uh, and it's in Little Tokyo. And it's been in several places in Little Tokyo. But I think I'm on an effort in to try to raise the importance of Little Tokyo and Japan towns. Uh, you know, there were over 40 in California before the war. And now they are three or three and a half. Uh, San Jose, San Francisco, LA, and Sautel that remain. And uh, Los Angeles doesn't have a legacy program, uh, a city, you know, 
entity that deals with legacy either businesses or areas. And so there's some of us that are trying to um, push the city to the point of where they designate either legacy areas, because you know, Little Tokyo, as I believe, is going on 137, 138 years of being here. So that's what I'm leaning toward a film on on Zen hardware. Thanks. Jeff, uh, current projects? I'm trying to capture one of the rarest occurrences that happens in Little Tokyo. Uh, basically, I'm trying to capture a rainy day. <laughs> okay, you can come to Oregon. We got a lot of those. Uh, uh, Fran, uh, what are your current projects? I'm doing, uh, the tentative title is The Seniors Bringing Cheers to Elders. And um, I, I belong to a group that played the ukulele, guitar, drums, ipu, and so forth, dance the hula. And we sing in different languages, Filipino, Japanese, Hawaiian, English. And uh, we go to senior centers. And uh, so that's what it is. But I'm not going out to to film this. It's all in my iPhone. Um, all I'm doing now is on, it's on my timeline and I'm editing right now. And and I'm limited because that's, I'm just working with what I have. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Thanks, uh, George, current projects. Um, currently, I've been kind of following um, a judge from Santa Clara Superior Court. His name is Johnny Gogol. He has taken on a project on his own, all on his own time and time. Uh, he has obtained 48 star American flags and he's been going up and down the coast and across the country, getting people who were interned in the camps to sign it. And I'm trying to, I guess, uh, show how this has impacted those people who have, many people who have come out to sign a thing. He has, dedicated one flag to the San Jose Japanese American Museum on Fred Korematsu Day just this past weekend. And he has other plans for the other flags. He's got a total of four at this time. Um, so the film is going to be about that. Patty Fong, what are your current projects? I'm currently researching the story of my maternal grandparents. Um, I know, don't know much about them. My grandfather was an undocumented um, alien smuggled into the United States and um, trying to go through National Archives and other sources to find a paper trail of what port of entry and how he ended up in St. Louis um, as, a, as a businessman. And uh, he experienced the American dream. Thanks. Uh, and Joe, uh, what are your current projects? Well, um, I got two things that I'm working on right now for digital histories. I am trying to figure out how to operate a camera on a bicycle and not crash into a river. And so we'll, we'll see how that one works out. I'm, I'm hoping to uh, sort of catch views of my neighborhood from, uh, from my bicycle. Uh, the project that I'm working on is with uh, Filipino American National Historical Society down here in the Orange County and Inland Empire. We are collecting oral histories. And while we don't have a clearly defined set of projects or interviews yet, I have great confidence that a good number of them will end up on film. And so I'm looking forward to uh, uh, working that into a project in the future. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, thanks to all of you panelists for spending time with the historian audience and making films that teach us about history and experiences and, and making the history come alive. I encourage the audience to see these films and to follow the filmmakers and support their work. Uh, the audience should be sure to rate all the films uh, that you see because your favorite film could receive an audience choice award. And to the filmmakers here, con continued success to all of you and thank you for spending your time with us today.